Well, hello, everybody. We are back, and we're just going to broaden out the discussion of what you've just heard. And I, I think the easiest way to do this is the, the two new people joining us here. Why don't you guys tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what we can expect? Chris, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, hello. So I'm Chris Richard, really happy to be here. I'm the CTO at ratehub.ca. Uh, which is Canada's online financial comparison platform. Uh, our head office is in Toronto, but uh, we're building our development team here uh, in Kingston. We've got eight developers working in the woolen mill. So really pleased to be here uh, and you know support this breakout project. Um, I went to school at Waterloo, University of Waterloo, uh, computer engineering, and uh, shortly after graduating, went out to Redmond, Washington to work for the beast of Redmond, Microsoft, and worked there for about five years on a variety of different sort of projects. Uh, and moved home and actually continued working for Microsoft for a couple years doing remote work. And uh, after that, kind of had my fill and wanted to strike out on my own and was looking for sort of what to do. And my sister, Alyssa Richard, who was here last night, um, did, a, did a talk about the story of Rate Hub, really. And she, you know, was serendipitous type of thing. I was looking for work and a, a good project, and she had started uh, this company, and the rest is really history. Seven years later, still working uh, on Rate Hub, really, really enjoying it. And uh, really sort of, we like to think that we you know, really support users and uh, have the user as our, you know, always in our mind when we're building what, what, we, build, what we build at Rate Hub and trying to give them all the tools and education they need to make, to make the right financial decisions. Okay, I, th I think you're doing a little bit more than just working. I think you're pretty successful at, at what you've done. <laughs> Surrender, tell yeah. us about yourself. Sure thing. So my name is Surrender Singh, and I'm president of a company called North Cloud. And North Cloud is essentially a technology strategy and execution firm. So we typically build um, technology solutions, platforms, mobile apps. Um, you know, whether it's helping multinationals or startups or events like that. Um, you know, spread their marketing outreach and you know build a platform that can engage with. Um, their users or um, you know businesses that that require technology to to power some of the initiatives they have, and uh, you know we've been lucky enough to be involved with the breakout project, having built the platform that users are on today. Um, you know the teams actually using the platform to collect to collect money, um, you know accept time, um, offers of time, as well as just spreading the message out there on different social media channels, as well as um, you know trying to recruit um, new members to actually help out the initiatives. And Kaj, did you want to uh, further reintroduce yourself? Yes, so I'm Kai Arne, coming from Germany and Finland. I have a background as uh, an entrepreneur in IT. I had my own company for 14 years, then joined uh, uh, MySQL AB, a database, an open source database, uh, where I stayed until the bitter end, which was not very bitter. We were we exited with. Uh, uh, Sun Microsystems, and I continued there for a while, after which then I uh, founded MariaDB uh, together with six friends of mine, and I'm continuing there in that company, serving uh, those who need databases. Terrific, okay. I want to, so we've established that you guys are the real deal. Uh, so I want to start with a pretty broad question. Uh, are there technical solutions, technology solutions, to the world's biggest problems? In other words, if we're looking to solve hunger, war, uh, climate change, on and on and on, uh, is technology going to provide us the answers? No. <laughs> Do you care to elaborate? Well, in, uh, I have to be true to my Finnish roots, and we usually answer with just one syllable. <laughs> so, yeah, as, as uh, society develops, technology finds solutions to things, but I believe that for every new solution, there will be some kind of new problems, and we see that in very practical situations, and we see that also with, with war. So that's my, the reason for my answer, no. Okay. Uh, surrender. I think it's an enabler. I don't think it's going to be the be-all, end-all. Um, you know, I think it's a function of using technology to 
uh, get to where we want to, but I think it obviously involves people as well coming together and finding a solution uh, towards some of these problems. Uh, but I also think that, you know, I don't want to sound like an alarmist, but technology itself can also create new problems that we need to be mindful of. And we're going to get into that in a second, but Chris, as an overall uh, thing, I mean, we, you know, we, we do, and we're going to get into AI and what AI can do in the world of medicine, quantum computing, and all that sort of stuff. But as a general concept, should we be looking at technology to solve our problems? I think echoing what the other gentlemen here have said, I, yeah, I really think it, it it's part of the solution, can be part of the solution, but it can also be part of the problem. Um, I was trying to think of some examples, but just I feel like it, technology can help amplify the, the good and the bad. Um, and yeah, we, we see you know great examples of that, I think, every day, this, this project and, and the fact that it's focused on social good um, is an example of how it, it can be amazing, but it, it comes from those, those values that, that I think we all share here. Um, but yeah, I don't know, technology, I think of the the internet and the amazing capacity for communication, um, but it can also amplify, you know, extremist voices and, and some some of that negative uh, parts that we see sort of in today's today's world. Well, since all three of you have brought it up, let's let's delve deep into the problems that technology can create. And I'm thinking, in particular, AI has got perhaps more of an influence, but robotics as well. Uh, We've heard this a lot, Elon Musk has talked about it, about the need to develop a different set of social platforms, not technology platforms, but support platforms, because technology is gonna put a lot of people out of work, and it's not necessarily gonna create any new jobs, or any new jobs, enough new jobs to take over from the jobs that are lost as a result of the, of the, the new economy. Uh, how serious a problem do you guys see this as being? Do you want to start surrender? Sure, yeah. I think, you know, when you think about what you just stated with Elon Musk about, you know, autonomous cars, for example, obviously companies like Uber and Google are, are exploring some of these options. Um, you know, the question we've got to ask is what happens to the taxi drivers out there? What happened to those truck drivers out there? What happens to people working the shop floors? What do we do with them? And I think that, you know, when, when we're bringing in AI, for example, for commercialization, I think we need to somehow look into leveraging AI um, in, a, in a social way um, to be able to retrain some of these individuals or to be able to find uses for, you know, um, you know where they can go, where they can, where they can move to. So, for example, um, one of the projects over here, the East End Project, they're really passionate about um, teaching science, technology, engineering, math to, you know, to young girls, but also obviously expanding it out to society um, um, at large. And I think it's a function of, you know, how do we use technology to retrain the future population um, and actually elevate, um, you know, elevate skill sets, elevate capabilities, um, and trying to figure out how can we leverage, how can we leverage human capital in a different way moving forward? Because bringing in new technology, like we said, you know, it's going to create problems, and we need to be a step or two ahead of that, and trying to figure out what do we do with the taxi drivers or the truck drivers once these vehicles start driving on their own. I, and I can't help but feel that maybe, you know, th the answer to the questions, you know, we'll have to retrain them. What goes through my mind is retrain them for what? Uh, it is possible that there are no new jobs out there. We don't need legions of people in factories anymore. Uh, you pointed out we don't need truck drivers. We don't need cab drivers. Those are not things that are ever going to come back again. And it's hard to imagine a labor-intensive new thing happening. Uh, any new thing that happens now is going to have such a technological component to it that it is going to minimize the amount of human effort that has to go into producing a widget or producing whatever. What, what's your thoughts on this? So first of all, the, the, the problem is a big one. I think we, we all agree to that, that, that technology eliminates uh, work at, at times. Um, I think then the, the real issue is what kind of a, now this sounds like a Swedish social democrat from the 1970s whom I used to hate and still <laughs> partially hate. It's about what kind of a society we want to live in and that's sort of a standard phrase that they used. But in a certain way that is exactly what it is about. So uh, what is uh, just, what is right, what is, what is wrong, um, and, and, and I think that if, if we now, those who happen to have the resources 
to create technology that eliminates labor, if they get to uh, reap all the benefits, it's also unjust. You can say that, yeah, sure, but they, they were the ones that contributed the innovativeness and they created the, the, uh, uh, the innovations so they should reap the benefits because, hey, we live in a free society and we want, we want there to be free enterprise. True. That is, that is true, but it's not the entire truth, because you could ask, so how, how come that they were the ones that, that, that now happen to have those resources? And some of that comes from situations like in the Soviet Union in 1991. It's like when, when man came to Iceland, it was an empty place, and those who came first could grab it. And the same thing uh, happened with, with uh, uh, the industry in, in, in the Soviet Union. They spontaneously privatized things, and now we live in a society that allows for spontaneous privatization, but then when things go wrong, we socialize the losses. And that, that must not be the case. So I think the, uh, the answer here comes by, by all of us studying ethics and all of us looking at, at, at those deep moral uh, questions and, and think about what's, what's right and wrong. And I don't think that there's an answer yet. I think that the question has to be posed on an ethical level rather than a technology level. Okay, so Chris, picking up on, on that point, uh, you know, I, and I, I don't want to go into social programs and what's good or bad, but, you know, things like basic annual incomes have been talked about as a, as a way around this problem. But what I really want to know is what sort of responsibility do you feel that you have, and I mean you a little bit collectively, uh, the young entrepreneurs killing, killing it in the business, do you feel a sense of responsibility for fixing the mess that you're making? <laughs> yeah, if I'm honest, I, it's something I think about actually fairly often. I, I think a lot of us kind of look back a, a, a little bit in history, and it, it's kind of sort of the this, this standard economic line, really, that, that technology creates as many jobs as it destroyed. And I think it's, it, it's a bit confusing, because I think that was the case for a long time, and I, I think, personally, I kind of think we passed that point where we've you know, it's it, more jobs are being lost than are being created. And there'll be sort of things that, you know, come along and new industries will be created, but they, I think we've sort of crossed that peak. And so in, in our work, like personally, my work, I, I do consider it and I think that, you know, we, we are doing some, you know, automating of business processes and stuff. Uh, in most cases, you know, we're automating work that, you know, our clients and stuff just don't want to do. It's a time sink for them. Um, they'll be able to serve their, their clients better and you know, their, do their job better, and I don't think it's gonna cause too much in the way of job losses. Um, but in some industries, like obviously Uber and some of the other examples we've talked about, like, it's, like the, the numbers are staggering. Um, so it, it is something that I think about. Luckily, I, I think our little project that, that we work on is you know, not really too much of a problem, um, but, but these types of questions are just gonna become increasingly uh, to the forefront. I think, and I, I don't know that I have, have the answer. Yeah, well, to, to your point, it's not a question of having the answer at this point. It's a question of pursuing the solution because we don't have it. But, you know, I mean, I think of where we've come in five years on e-commerce, and not just the success of the e-commerce platforms, but what it's doing to our towns and cities. It's literally changing the landscape because we don't need those many stores anymore. Uh, bricks and mortar retailers are going out of business left, right, and center. And there aren't enough, you know, great Asian fusion restaurants to take up all the real estate that they leave behind. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I just want to push this one step further and to say with what we've seen and what we can imagine right now of how society is going to change as a result of this. Do you think that what we've imagined so far is where we're going to end up, or is this a revolution that we can't possibly see because the hill is too high and what's on the other side remains a mystery? I, I think, you know, I, I definitely think that there's a, there's a revolution coming. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of hard, it's obviously hard to predict the future. If you look back, history of time, we've got the Industrial Revolution started, you know, efficiency, productivity, it started out in the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it's just kind of, it's just kept up, it's just kept up with, um, you know, pace of change. 
And obviously, um, you know, as, as Kai mentioned, it's a free market, and you know that in, invisible hand works its magic every single year. And you know, people want things faster, better, cheaper, um, and that's really where the drive or the need is coming from. And I think that you know, moving forward, you know, it started out with the industrial revolution, um, and then we've got the information age, and then now you know we're in we're in the tech sector, and then the tech sector is only getting smarter with a things like AI, for example. I think a lot of this is definitely going to change, and, and bringing it back to things like local impact, I'm, I'm noticing it where I live right now, where a lot of these local shops, boutique shops, or even, even big brand shops are closing down because of things like e-commerce. Um, you know, you don't need a storefront anymore. You don't need that 100,000 square foot warehouse anymore, or, or storefront anymore, and things just come to you the next day, for example. Um, and there's lots of innovations with respect to commerce, for example. Um, even making things, um, um, you know, make, making things easily accessible, for example, whether it's through your computer, your phone, or even little smart buttons. I don't know what Amazon has something called the Dash, um, where you literally just press a button and then they just send you that device, you know, whether it's a, a Dash device for a kitchen item or a laundry item or whatever the case is. It's, it's really hard to predict any of this stuff. Um, I, I think you just kind of, you know, go with, with, um, with what the market demands and I think that the private sector really fuels a lot of this and And I think from a social perspective. I think once again, you know We need to go back and say if we're using this technology to um, Further the private sector. We've, we've got to find ways to leverage that um, You know to help out with social innovation as well Kai I was you know, we have been talking sort of about the negative aspects of of this revolution there are, there is another side to it, obviously, and I think, for example, of quantum computing and the revolution that that is going to create in healthcare. Uh, quantum computing, if you talk to the true believers, uh, will be able to detect anything that's wrong with you in an instant, and be able to, if you believe them, cure you. Uh, now, I'm not sure that you can cure everything with a computer, but. Uh, there is going to be that positive side of things uh, that, uh, that has been science fiction up to this point. You know, it's going to be Dr. McCoy with the tricorder and telling you what's wrong. I mean, this is all coming to light. It is going to be part of the revolution, though, isn't it? Yeah, but the same thing is here already today. I mean, uh, yes, I've represented views which are a bit skeptical of some of the things, uh, aspects of, of technology. But hey, uh, most of the things technology has, has brought us, I have be benefited from uh, a lot myself, like being here in Canada wouldn't be possible without technology. I couldn't swim here. And, and, and taking pictures and, and driving around, like uh, there's so many good things with, with technology. So obviously there will be new good things represented by the new technology that, that, that we haven't seen. Uh, what, what I would want to go back to is, is here mentioning the invisible hand and the level playing field. So I think that is what has been missing now and what should be uh, taken into account when applying these new uh, technology f f f for the good, like who deserves being diagnosed by this magical new thing? Uh, those who can afford it based on, on their current income and, and current uh, uh, level of wealth, or is it something that, that, that should be widened to, to, to most people? So I think the, the and, and, and specifically on this invisible hand, what I think, uh, this, this invisible hand, uh, the, the limits of the, the invisible hand is about under what rules this invisible hand can operate. So I think that most people in most any country would, would uh, object if, if, if I used uh, uh, power in the form of a handgun to, to persuade you to do something. And, and of course, in a certain way, uh, uh, not all of the power being used is equal to handguns, uh, and still it's not ethical. So if most people would, would say it's, it's unethical to kill, but not everybody would agree up, upon what is ethical and non-ethical when it comes to bi business. So are you allowed to use your position as an incumbent to keep other players out? And I think that is that is not what a free society is about. It's, it, the, the invisible hand has been amputated. 
if, if that is the case, if only the incumbent players get to innovate, then, then it, it's the equivalent of a monopoly and there will not be a very high speed of innovation. And I think that is the core issue that we have failed with up on the, the last 10, 20, 30 years and what we need to solve going forward. Let me just indulge this point for, for another round here because it is interesting that you know, the, the question of a, of a level playing field, the question of what do we do with all these unemployed people, I mean, the reality is, is that if there are massive amounts of people who are not making an income, you're gonna run out of customers pretty quickly. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it relies on, uh, on a very traditional model of consumers and producers uh, in, an endless, in an endless circle. But I wonder, you know, and it's a question I think that would apply to anybody, no matter what stage of development you're uh, you're in. Uh, and and it, it I guess it's simply this that comes back to the question of responsibility. But the model that you use to achieve success in this business is a hard model. All of you know that. All of you know that the business model has to be right. You've got to make the right decisions at the right time, especially in scaling up and, and in, in terms of you know, creating a business model that works. But that very creation is not aimed at establishing a level playing field. That model, that business model is created, is designed to create exactly the opposite of a level playing field. So how do you, how can you ever bridge that gap? between the dynamics of what is necessary to be successful in a startup or in, in a mature company as opposed to what is good for society because it seems that they're just at opposite ends of the incentive pole. I'll, I'll jump yeah, back. I mean, I, I agree completely. I, I, I see, you see that every day, I'd say, and, and then think about it, and, and sometimes I do you know, wonder if it's intractable um, or that, that things are just need to get, you know, unfortunately considerably worse before we, we sort of take the, the steps that I, th I think people are starting to realize are going to be necessary at, you know, sooner or later. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be the, the story of the next, you know, of the century probably. And it's interesting, I'm, you know, I, I'm putting these questions to you guys and perhaps it's a little bit unfair, but I tell you, I think that people more and more are looking to people like you for the answers as opposed to looking at their governments for the answers. I think that there is more trust, for example, in, uh, in the three of you and everybody watching us right now uh, than there is in the, in the political system. The fact that Elon Musk talks about this and says something about it gets enormous coverage. People are fascinated by what he has to say. So I think that in some respects, uh, you know, those who are doing extremely well in the new economy, in the, in, the, in the tech economy, won't be able to hide from the responsibility of actually having to be kind of social arbiters as well as technical arbiters because, uh, you know, as, as the effects of this revolution roll out, the victims of it are going to be looking to you, not in, a, in an accusing way necessarily, but saying, well, now what do we do? Our politicians aren't up to the job of asking or answering that question, but you guys are all smart guys. You guys got to have the answer. Haven't got an app for this? You know, isn't there an app for fixing this? So I think, uh, you know, that's just, a, that's more a comment than a question. But I think that you guys really are going to be, and everybody else who is involved in this economy, is going to have to really think about these questions, which leads me to a new thing, and that is talking about education and getting can I have a comment on what oh, you just do. said? Please do. Please go. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think, yeah. yes, but the but part here is that it's it's um, if you ask us who are in business and and whose task is to generate wealth for our shareholders, if you ask us to come with social innovation, it's a bit like uh, putting the fox in charge of, of the hen house. It's 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 not our task. And if we say something about it, then it is either self-serving or it's not knowledgeable. It, it, it's just not our task. It's good that we try to think about it, but don't, put, don't believe that, that we could substitute for, for politicians. But aren't you, aren't you more concerned, though, that if the solutions to deal with people like you 
are out of your hands and in the hands of somebody who maybe doesn't even understand the business that you're in. Aren't you concerned that there could be greater damage done that way than there would be if you got involved? No. <laughs> The, the famous Finnish answer. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I think somebody should put limits to what we can do in business, and they don't need to know the details of databases or, or details of, of any of the technology. I think the, the things that guide how business should be done can be uh, expressed in the words of Adam Smith or Immanuel Kant or, or Montesquieu, like things... Uh, uh, the thoughts can be expressed in, in the tools of, of people 100 years ago or 200 years ago uh, to regulate the uh, invisible hand so that the playing field truly is level. Let me, though, pose this to you as, as a bit of a counter-argument. And all the teams that are here at the Breakout Project doing these very socially progressive ideas but using technology to make it happen. Uh, in your view, is, is there an answer, and I go back to the very first question I asked, is there a, is there a tech answer for the, the world's woes? But in regards to whatever you think the responsibilities of the entrepreneurs may be, the solutions have to come from some source, and whether they're expressed through politicians or expressed through technology is maybe beside the point. But when you take a look at the projects that are being done now, I mean, the attempt to, uh, you know, increase education in the poorest parts of the world, to increase the extent of dealing with at-risk youth, normally these were all things that governments did in the past. Now, take a look what's happening. What's motivating these people is to do social good and to use the, the red wire and the yellow wire and the blue wire to do it. Uh, how much of the future landscape is this social uh, aspect of technology going to be? Is it perhaps one of the avenues that the industry, even in a hive mind, could say, this is our give back, that we will, we will try and make things better, we'll make the world better by using technology, not for amassing financial capital, but amassing social capital. I, I mean, I think you see, you're, you're starting to see that already with, uh, you know, for example, my old boss, uh, Bill Gates and the, the Gates Foundation, you know, recognizing that, you know, there are these technical things that can help, but that they're not going to get addressed by traditional sort of capitalist, uh, you know, economies and stuff like that. So it, Warren Buffett as well, you know, some of these people that have made oodles of money, um, take a step back and, and, and decide that that is what they want to you know, focus on and that they do have a responsibility there and, and can really impact uh, you know, huge numbers of people. I also think that, that on the, uh, it sort of touches on something maybe a couple points ago, but just as awareness increases, I think our, our role as consumers uh, you know, can change and that we can start making decisions that will impact you know, how, these, how these corporations and how these entities behave. Um, Currently, I think that you know, a lot of times it's just a matter of what, what product is cheapest, or what ch product is you know, the best right now. But you know, if we start to reward, you know, price is still going to be a big component of that. But if we start to reward social aspects and take a bit more interest and have a bit more awareness of of you know the companies that are producing all these products we consume, you know, in theory we should be able to move the needle. Um, Can I just add that? Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, if we're looking for social impact, I don't think, you know, you can just rely on technology, even looking at the event that we're at today and, you know, the various project teams that we have out there. Um, they're using technology to spread the message, but, but, the, but the key here really is awareness, uh, finding purpose and, and having people come together um, and acting on that purpose as opposed to going out and the first thing that comes to your mind is what kind of app you need or what kind of technology do you need? I think it's, it's really trying to find a common bond amongst society that can actually come together for that cause to do something for that cause. Um, you know, just what Chris mentioned with his, with, his, uh, with his boss, I think, what is it, the Melinda and Gates Foundation? 
Yeah, so I mean, a lot of their stuff is, is really around raising awareness, um, contribu you know, financial contribution, time contribution, and then trying to figure out where, you know, where technology has a role, as opposed to jumping to technology first. Yeah. Let me move this into the area of education, because we've, we've touched on it. And I, I want to bring government back into this to, to get your sense as to what the proper role for government is in this industry. And we can look at a couple of different things, everything from incentives uh, to actually trying to be angel investors themselves, which some governments are doing, to create uh, tech corridors, as they're trying to do in Seattle. But when I take a look at what's happening in Canada, the number of, uh, or the lack, I should say, of computer engineers coming out of our schools, and among those computer engineers who are coming out of the schools, a really dismal percentage of them are women. Uh, there's a high, you know, there, there's a real female deficit in this, in this whole industry. Uh, where's the intersection between, bus between business, and I mean the, the new economy business, and government? In terms, specifically in terms of education, how do we get more computer engineers? How do we get more kids interested in becoming computer engineers? And specifically, how do we increase the role of half the world in that, which is, which is the female component? Yeah, so you have an all-male group of panelists here, and as if we would be the, the experts to answer that. What I know in observing, um, I've seen a trend of the uh, ratio between women and uh, men programmers, and there was a, a point in, I don't know, was it 1978 or 82, where the, the growth curve uh, no longer was the same. So there, were, there was an ever uh, narrowing gap of female programmers up until that point, and then something happened, and it sure was not the genetics of women. So it's not about the genetic predisp predisposition. It's about something else. It's about the, the attitude of, of society and, and, and like the gaming culture, I suppose, was something that, 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 that influenced this. And now you're asking us how to reverse this, this trend. It's really, really hard to, to, to reverse. I think uh, giving education and mandating everybody to also have a mathematical uh, education is, is a very good starting point. I think also there's another gen or reverse gender gap with, with boys at school usually being the stupid gender and the, the underachieving gender. Uh, so, so, so I think this is this is this is an issue that, that we really need to focus on. Yeah. And, and and your views on that in terms of is there a role, even a dual role, government and industry, the tech industry, uh, addressing this, uh, or come up with another solution? But how do we how do we get around this this problem of a lack of computer engineering and, and the makeup of who they are? I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities out there now with, you know, obviously you've got your traditional computer science programs, engineering programs, but there are also a lot of um, so-called code camps or boot camps that actually help teach programming to people that are interested. So I, I definitely think the opportunities are there as far as, you know, government playing a role. Um, not really sure how you know how they would um, entice people to, to go down that stream outside of providing opportunities, uh, funding. I know the Ontario government, um, you know, working with VCs out there, for example, um, you know, to to stimulate um, you know the startup culture to get people thinking about innovative ideas, technology solutions. Uh, but but I think you know one of the things one of the breakout teams um, um, that are you know that, that that's doing this really well is is eSTEM, right? Trying to get younger children, um, you know, into technology, into engineering, into math um, at a younger age, as opposed to you know waiting till you get to high school or university and trying to figure out what you want to do. But but I also wonder if our education, um, the curriculum at least, is is changing or shifting towards some of these higher order jobs. Um, you know, obviously, what we think of school, and I've been out of school now for a while. So I wonder if curriculums are changing out there to adapt to what's happening in the marketplace. 
Yeah, and that's that has been an. You're right. That's been an issue for a while that people have identified. And I just, unless Chris, did you want to get in on this? But I wanted to. Um, just a comment that came to my mind is uh, you do see initiatives starting. I, I think even here in Kingston, there's a, a ladies learning to code group. Yeah. Um, which is I think going to be you know hugely beneficial. You're already seeing results in some of the bigger centers, and now it's you know there's a a network of these groups that are spreading across the country and I think the probably the world. Um, so that's that's something that's definitely super positive. Um, yeah, just with the East M365 that you mentioned, that's one of the groups that I um, you know really support and really resonated with me, uh, especially because of the numbers that I think we've all seen that you know this number or this percentage of of women and and boys, but women is particularly uh, you know on the low end uh, that get into the higher higher end academic math streams and you know with relatively little investment, the, the amount of impact that they were able to have, you know. It's one of those things where it's it's really easy to get um, I don't know overwhelmed by by a technology or uh, your, your first impression of it is that it's it's too complex and you don't really get it and then you just kind of you know shy away from it and and that it's it's okay you, you might not understand it the first time but it's something you need to just keep going back to you know be very focused on it and and you know it's not, you're not going to learn it overnight I guess and that that's okay. Um, so changing the attitude that way. I know that we're talking about uh, the role of AI in particular in terms of social innovation, and that's sort of our, our topic. But I do want to take advantage of the fact that three very successful people sitting here. And I'm interested in, and Kai, I don't know what the situation is in Europe, but I'm sure it mirrors what we're doing here. The government is trying to figure out you know, when, when we're trying to ramp up or scale up places like Kingston or create a technology corridor on the West Coast, virtually every city these days is trying to create a, a technology corridor. And government is getting into the business of investing in these companies, which seems to be anathema. I mean, it's if you're an entrepreneur, you're not looking for government money. Uh, and once you take it, you learn that you never want it again. Uh, just the auditing process alone will kill you. I, are governments moving in the right direction on that front, however, despite what I think about it? Uh, should governments, in your view, be stepping up and investing, taking the role, taking, not taking over the role, but moving into that space of, of either angel investors or even ventures? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but you're you're a social democrat from Finland, so of course you'd say that. Uh, no, but I, please go ahead. Tell me why you think. Yeah, that's so so I think it's 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 the opportunity to actually level the playing field in an easy way. So I think uh, if the the playing field were level to begin with, it would not be needed. But because it isn't, then that's how you counter it. So. You accused me of being a social democrat. I'm not. Not that I think that it's a bad thing to be one, but I am not. And 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 I think that if if uh, the level uh, the, the the playing fields truly can be made neutral, so that uh, a better innovator can compete against an incumbent, then those monies will not be needed. But right now, it's not that way. So that's why it's sort of the bad conscience of governments who have failed to create that level playing field. So they hand out some uh, some money to to uh, the underdogs. But but does it in any way disrupt the marketplace when government is taking over the role or joining the role of uh, what should be properly uh, private investors with the normal? Why do you say it should be? That that already is a value statement. It, it is a value statement, but I'll tell you why I say it. Because if you're a private investor, and all of you know this, that you're investing in a company, uh, and you've got metrics to decide whether that's going to work, you're investing so that the other the person receiving the money will invest. Government has very different metrics as to what is success and what is failure. And that's what I mean by the disruption. So should, yeah, you've called me out on that, and I think you're right to call me out on that. I wasn't making a value judgment so much as I was saying that the outcomes uh, for the very same action are different because of the motivation of the person giving the money out. And I'm wondering if you feel that that's a disruptive force in the market that actually could hinder more than it could help, or perhaps, as you were suggesting, it is the very thing we need. Can I just can I just add yeah. something here? I, I don't know of all the programs that are that are taking place at the federal or provincial level, but 
you know, the two programs that I'm aware of, one, one being the Shred and the other one being the IRAP, I think they're pretty good programs to have out there uh, for companies looking for funding, especially in the tech sector, um, because one of the metrics that they look at isn't necessarily ROI on the money, but they look at e economic stimulus. Are you going to go and hire a college grad, for example? Are you going to go and hire another Canadian? Um, are you going to create more jobs? So from that perspective, you know, it sounds like a good deal. And there are also newer initiatives where the government is partnering with VCs in the industry to disperse funds. And I think going down that channel might be more traditional VC style investing, where the, the measurement is ROI versus you know, counting jobs, for example. So it sounds like a good deal. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, if, sort of full disclosure, we've sort of taken advantage of both of the grants that uh, <laughs> Surinder mentioned. Um, and it, it, you know, as writing them sometimes, I, I feel like, is, is this you know, the, the best use of my time? Like, wouldn't, you know, I, shouldn't I be focusing on my business? Um, but we are in a, especially myself in the financial industry, we're in an industry with, you know, a, essentially, you know, oligopolistic, borderline monopolistic banking sector. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is value in trying to, you know, you know root for the underdog a little bit. I, I think there is, uh, the challenge is kind of what you mentioned is the, should the government be sort of picking the winners and, um, are there not a bunch of other companies that maybe we compete with that didn't receive the same funding? Um, that's the, the hard part, I think. Let me just take us down a completely different path. Uh, and and it, it has something to do with the idea of social inequality as a result of the industry, but through a very different lens. Uh, it, it comes down to this, and it's those part the number of people participating in it. Uh, we've seen, you know, seniors are beginning to ramp up in their use of, uh, of the technology. Young people use it from the moment they're born, but, you know, the task is trying to steer them to use it the right way and the most effective way. But I'm wondering whether there's, uh, there's another thing that has to be tackled here, and that is access to broadband. Uh, we know that you can do all the good work you do. But if it's inaccessible, not only to people in remote areas in Africa and Asia, but here in Canada, uh, there are vast areas where you cannot get a, a signal and therefore you can't participate in, in that economy. Uh, I'd just like to get your views on how, uh, how important you think that is to fix and what the fix may be. Well, that is the typical example of a level playing field. Yeah. It, 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 it's a very fundamental such. And we do need access, uh, reasonable access from, from most places to, to, to the network. So I think it, it, there's a trivial... Uh, my answer is, is fairly obvious. Yes, we need it. And fixing it, have you got any preference? I mean, should this be a proper role for government? Absolutely. That is the very role of, of government to ensure that these innovations can happen in, in, in many places. So you can take it also to an extreme. Now, this is not exactly about broadband. It's about society as a whole. In Norway, which is a country which is about the same level of uh, po population density as many parts of Canada, they have, of course, they have lots and lots of oil money, so they can afford to, to, to have these programs. But they have this idea that all parts of Norway should be populated. And it's the role of government to ensure that it's possible to do so. And that's not just about broadband, it's about access to healthcare, it's about access to schools and, and, and all of that. And they build tunnels for oodles of, of Norwegian kroner. So, so you can sort of take it uh, uh, to, to an extreme. But broadband, if you're looking at specifically technology, that is what the government needs to. to have, they need to tax people who have the, the money to be taxed and organizations that have that money in order to, to ensure that, that everybody get access to the modern society. Any thoughts to add to that? I, I think it, it definitely should be a basic necessity um, because it levels the playing field. You know, if you don't have access to the internet, you don't have access to information, it's, it's very hard to compete um, in this day and age globally. So I'm not sure if, if government necessarily would be the ones uh, putting out that kind of infrastructure, but definitely working with the private sector to, to bring you know, to get this reach out into communities that don't have this reach, 
um, and get them online, get them back on the playing field so that you know, they, can, they can be a, a positive contributor to society. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, I agree with both of the gentlemen up here. Um, it, it, I think it is the fundamental role of, of government to do this kind of, to support these types of projects and make sure everyone is connected. And I think, you know, Canada did that very well with the sort of original telecommunications. We were sort of a leader there and, and having phone lines, you know, to all the remotest, most remote, and electricity to the most remote parts of the country was a big investment that was made in the past. Um, and with the broadband internet specifically, I feel like it hasn't been as equally sort of distributed. Um, so, yes, I think it's, it's maybe a, a spot where technology actually can play, play a role in that as the cost comes down for some of these newer transmission technologies and stuff, whether it's satellite or whatever, where wiring, like, you know, taking a fiber optic cable all the way up to the most remote regions is maybe not economically feasible, even if you, you know, have a government surplus, which we don't really, but <laughs> um, where tech maybe technology and can bring the cost down to the point where it is feasible. Mm -hmm. I, and with that, once we, once we do have broadband access everywhere, that ushers in a new type of revolution, doesn't it? Because, I mean, I remember I was up very, very far north in this country and went into a, what I considered to be a very remote settlement. And uh, everybody was in the community hall uh, and they were watching Detroit television because the soap opera was on. And nothing could be more removed from their lives than a soap opera from the United States, but they were hooked on it. And you realized when I saw that, I thought, this has changed this place forever. This is never going to be the same again. So, not that change is a bad thing, but change is coming, and that's all part of the revolution. I just want to conclude with one remark here. If you had a magic wand, it's a famous magic wand question, and you could wave it and deal with not only education and participation, but also the whole question of social innovation, uh, which is not necessarily uh, distinct from business uh, solutions. But if you had a magic wand to fix what you thought was not just wrong, but maybe sort of nudge the direction of everything in a certain way, and, uh, and that wand was absolute magic, what would you do with it? I would wave it so that there would be a level playing field. And, and by that level playing field, I hope that there will be more production in society, more productivity, uh, more wealth to be more evenly spread, and also very much cultural diversity so that everybody does not end up watching that Detroit show of yours. <laughs> Chris? Really challenging question, I think. Uh, so many things sort of go through my mind. Um, maybe a bit of a cop-out, but, but just education, getting equal educational opportunity. Um, I, I think the, the Million Teachers uh, project is, is another one that really resonates with me, and I think a lot of the people, I think they've got a lot of support. Um, because, yeah, I, I think that, that is gonna be the key, is you know, training the teachers to, to train the next generation of, of, of people that are gonna change the world. Surrender? Yeah, I definitely think education is key there for me. I think after, um, you know, once you've met the basic needs for society, you know, healthcare, food, shelter, all that good stuff, um, definitely we, we need to take a look at education because I think that that takes society up to a different level. It takes society up to a higher level. And, you know, going back to what we spoke about earlier where technology is actually going to um, create problems and, and end up um, causing jobs, I think, you know, it's not going to happen um, drastically, it's not just going to you know fall off the cliff. I think what ends up happening is that um, as one generation leaves and another comes in, I think we need to make sure that we've got the right type of education, um, technologies, and literally everything today that we do and use, um, and making sure that um, you know curriculums are changing in education. Education is pervasive. You can teach somebody in North America. You could teach somebody in Africa. It really doesn't matter where you are, um, and that's really where we need to start. And it seems to me, just flowing from what all of you are saying, that part of the revolution, which I find fascinating, is that we are going to start redefining what are basic human rights. Uh, we are going to define a basic human right as having access to the network. Uh, as much a human right as water is or clean air. 
Uh, we may get into the area where we find it acceptable for the first time to mandate or, or have mandatory teaching for everybody in a certain discipline because without that you can't participate and therefore you jeopardize that fundamental new human right that's coming in. And this is really, to me, in the end, the most fascinating thing about the journey that we're all on right now. We're not just creating new products online. We're not just creating a new cool app. We're not just creating financial wealth for those who do it well. But we're creating new rules for society. And in a way that we have rarely seen before, uh, except at very significant points of history when the whole concept of who we are as a people, as a nation, as a world, took some really strong turns. I mean, we had it in various revolutions. The American Revolution sort of set its, its sights on a new set of human rights. But I think that what we're living through right now, and always with history, if you're too close to it, you don't get to see it all that much. Uh, but it does seem to me that this is now the new revolution that is happening. We talk about a technical revolution, but I don't think we've ever examined it as profoundly as we should, and the profound impact it is going to have on the way that we organize ourselves as a species. And I think that's the really, kind of the exciting part about it. And whether you guys like it or not, you know, you're the founding fathers, so uh, <laughs> get ready for your portrait to be hang hung on the wall. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Uh, Kai, Chris, Surrender, thank you very much. Uh, great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Very interesting.